This is Real Sales Talk. Real sales advice from real sales practitioners. Giving you tips on how to dominate your sales quota are your co-host, Sean Mitchell and Phil Keen. What is going on, Real Sales Talk family? We have a very special guest, a local guy from me, Adam Weber, uh, and he is actually from a company called Amplify. He's a VP of Sales and co-founder. Uh, we're gonna have a great chat. And if you if you're on video, uh, you guys notice that Sean is missing. Sean hopefully is closing uh, some some big deals in real estate. Uh, and if you're in the Denver area, make sure you look him up. He is uh, he's all over it in real estate down there now. So, uh, Adam, thanks for joining us. Phil, good to be here. Happy Friday. How are you? Oh, wonderful, wonderful. So hopefully we can get this episode up, and for everybody at home, it's it's Happy Friday as well. Uh, let's let's get into it. So we're going to talk today about managing change and starting from scratch with your sales team. Uh, and the reason why I brought Adam on is because Adam, you've done this now three times. Uh, you managed through uh, a brand change. You've started from scratch and done it a couple times on your own. You've managed different types of teams and, and tried a, different th- a lot of different things that worked. Um, and I just think you're a great uh, leader to learn from, from a fundamental standpoint. Uh, a lot of it falls back to what we talked about in Ralph Barsi's episode a while back, which is that servant leader. Uh, so just overall inspirational leader. So I'm, I'm happy to have you on. So, so tell us a little bit about yourself and then we'll get started. Sure. Yeah. The, uh, I guess the quick version about myself, I, I live in Indianapolis. I'm in Zionsville, happily married for 10 years, got two boys. They're uh, eight and nine. Um, and yeah, right out of school, I was a pastor. I actually started a church when I was 22, um, and kind of fell in love with starting things. And so that made the natural transition that everybody totally understands from being a pastor to starting a career in sales. And, uh, pretty much from the very first day I showed up uh, to sales training before my first day in sales and a sales trainer, I'm in a room of 30 people. And he said, two people are going to master this thing. And, um, I just committed to it that day. You know, I decided that day that I wanted to be the very best that I possibly could be in sales. And I got the bug and I've been passionate about it ever since. And I spend every day trying to get better than I am today, you know, working to improve. So. Yeah. And I think the really unique thing about you as a sales leader is that you, you are still getting in, in the, in the dirt and you're working hard to get better at sales by yourself. Uh, and I think that's a really good key takeaway. We're going to call it really early from my conversations I've had with you. Um, so maybe talk about your philosophy. Let's just start from, from the very beginning of what you think about leadership in general, and then, and then we can get into how do you actually get started with that, your foundation of, of leadership, and then how do you build that into a sales team? Yeah, I think, you know, on the continuum of sales leaders, you know, everybody's got kind of their different flair and flavor to what they do. Um, as you mentioned, I, I love to sell. I'm passionate about it. Um, it's a strength of mine. You know, I'm really comfortable in the sales process. And, and, and if you even think about where our company started from, I was the first rep. I was the first SDR. I was the first AE. Um, and so for me, it always starts with I try to master the process myself. And so uh, the way that I lead, um, I really uh, focus first on can I sell this thing myself? And then I begin that process of deconstructing what I'm doing to sell a new thing and then start training other people on the team, you know, to. Um, but I, we're a highly collaborative, um, high coaching type of culture. I'm really fortunate right now that a lot of my team has been here for a while. And so a lot of them are at the master class level themselves. And so we, uh, we spend a lot of time just yesterday. I ran a call myself because I was getting rusty. I try to run at least one sales call a week. And, uh, and afterwards I hung up and, uh, there were two AEs that heard the call and I started getting feedback just like I give it to them. You know, they go, Hey, you missed this thing. Hey, what about this moment? And, um, we just try to create a collabor- a culture of excellence, right? Where you're always trying to get better, where nobody has it figured out. Sales just moves and changes so fast, just like the culture does. So, um, you know, that's one thing I work on. I'm really, really intentional about call feedback. I try to make sure I listen to calls every single week. Um, I think it makes, uh, it makes one-on-ones a lot richer with your, with your people when you actually have real things to help them get better. Um, I'm, I'm obviously I'm fiercely loyal to the people on my team too. want to do everything. I mean, part of the cool thing, one of the cool things about being a sales leader is your best reps. Like you have this really special relationship with, right? Because you cannot be successful without them. And so my job is to get out of their way, inspire them to be the best they can be, give them all the tools they need. And then just like, let them run. Right. I want to uncap their ups, like their career and their future and just put them in the best spot they can to succeed. 
So I think that's a, a really unique uh, way to think about just leadership in general is to just to create this environment where it's okay for even you to be coached back from your team and you have to check your ego. Talk about where that came from for you. Yeah, it was really born. I mean, it was truly like the very first week. Um, the first company I started was was called Blue Bridge, and we started with the same guys that I do Amplify with. But very first day, uh, sitting at a kitchen table where we started the business, and I had a list of 20 prospects and no product, and I picked up the phone to make a cold call. And admittedly, I'd really never done cold calls. Like I didn't know what I was actually doing, <laughs> you know? And so I like picked up the phone, and Santiago, who's our CEO, is sitting right beside me. And uh, as soon as the person answered, I like got up and I hid and I went to the other room. And um, I kind of, in the middle of that call, I had this epiphany like, I kind of am where I am, you know? I'm as good or as bad as I just am today. And so I walked right back down, I sat right beside him, and I just bombed the call right in front of him. <laughs> and, uh, and he just was like, that was terrible. And I was like, that was terrible. Uh, what could we do to make it better? And so I picked up the phone and I got a little bit better and a little bit better. And so every day, the, I mean, we, we do that here. You know, we, we have that foundation that everybody sucks at cold calls. <laughs> everybody has areas where, yeah, if other people are listening, you're not your best self. But I just, I fundamentally believe that if you take on that attitude that like you can get better, the way that you get better is by being open about it. The, the decline where you start to see reps, and in my view, where you start to see reps decline is when they start to go hide. They start to walk into the other room, right? They try to do it on their own. Uh, but if you're just open about where you are and you run that call and you can create a culture where everybody can help everybody, uh, you just start to, it starts to rise the tide and everybody starts to get better. All right. So we, the idea, the theme we kind of started with, you and I talked about, is just kind of starting stuff from scratch, which obviously you're the first salesperson, prospector, the first person really attacking that, that aspect of, of your, your company, which is Blue Bridge at the time. So talk about, we have a lot of entrepreneurs that, that listen to this, this, uh, this podcast how do you make your first sales hire? What do you, how did, how did you process that? Yeah, boy, that's a great question. And, uh, I do feel like it's the hardest in some ways it's the hardest part of the whole, the whole, uh, of growing a sales team is just getting that first hire. Right. So, um, I don't know. I think, I think the, the first thing is, can you do it yourself? I, I think that the biggest mistake people make is trying to go out and find some superstar sales rep that's going to somehow come in and magically sell a product that you can't sell yourself. So, Step one is, do you have mastery where you can confidently create a process? The second is, have you deconstructed that process, right? And then the third is, you got to find the right person. And um, one of the things I'm looking for, um, for, for me, is do you have somebody coachable and hungry and self-motivated um, and, and that's a good listener? <laughs> and uh, if, I've got, if I've got those attributes, uh, then yeah, I, I think that, that that might be a person. I, even early, especially with like new product sales, Past sales experience to me, I don't really care. You know, the fact if you could sell a product that has a recognized brand, it is totally different than selling a brand new product. Like we are inventing the future. It takes a unique, hungry fighter that can do that, you know? And so, and it doesn't necessarily mean experience. It means great listener, can solve their own problems, you know, like is a shark. All those are the attributes I'm looking for. And if I've got yeah. somebody who's hungry and willing to do that, um, they can succeed. And, and on mine, I got super, super lucky too, right? My, my first two sales hires both ended up just being absolute rock stars. And, um, and with that, you know, it really unlocked for me, it created a culture where things were possible, it was possible to succeed, right? It's, you can start to bring on other people after that, when people can look at those two and go, wow, you can actually do this. I see what they're doing. And then they can learn from them. And then the process continues. I think it's really interesting. So have you ever spoke to Kyle Porter about this from Sales Loft? I, I've spoken to Derek. I speak to Derek Grant a lot there, but I haven't talked to Kyle about it. So Kyle Porter talks about this. Mark Mark Sester is a VC out in San Francisco talks about this as well. And the idea is really early on is you only hire people that can fight above their weight class or punch above their weight class. Hmm. You only hire A players. The idea yep. would be, so you go after A players that, that maybe – like what you're saying is they're not from the big name company in your, in your, your town. They're maybe somebody that is a salesperson that wants to kind of cut their teeth and be a little bit gritty. And it's a, it sounds a lot like you were that hire originally for blue bridge. And then you found two more people that were like you that were, they were able to fight and wanted to grow, but maybe traditionally haven't done that already that still had the competency to move into that type of role. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about the makeup of those first two hires that you had. So tell me, tell me 
what made them unique and what made them uh, successful inside your organization? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, I mean, I think you nailed it too. Even, even myself, it's not like I had any pedigree and say, I was working for a small marketing agency before this and I really did fall in love with sales there, but I was a, a one man band. I had no sales manager. It was just me out there. Um, well, so I, I think a couple things in those first hires, I think, I think one, one that you can't, you can't miss on is culture. Because those first hires pave the the foundation for the rest of the team, you know. And so, if you whiff on culture, you really uh, you you can't really recover. It is a long process to recover. And even early, I I remember. I'll, I mean, I'll never forget. I was faced really early because I had some success right away. Like our company, we just grew faster than we expected. Um, and so we had a couple people reach out to us who were like known people in our community, you know. But they weren't. It wasn't the perfect culture fit. And I remember for me being. Um, First, trying to get over the awe of the fact that someone like that might want to work for me, but then really thinking through, what do I, what am I looking for uh, in, in, in people that join our sales team, and what type of sales culture are we t trying to create? So, yeah, I mean, I, I think for both of them, it was just like a, an excitement to be a part of something, but it was really a willingness to learn. Um, one, one of them actually, and also, I guess, early was a willingness to work for less money than anybody would ever work for. Like, you know, that's <laughs> like, I think that's the funny thing about startups is like everybody, especially when you have success, every, we all have stories of, I mean, you know, making minimum wage and you're like, yeah, I really did that. And now uh, once you have some success, it's obviously not like that. But uh, these guys, they, the, the two both came in with just an attitude that was like, I want to learn from you. Um, I'm here to learn and I want to master this thing and I want to get better. Um, and I'm really passionate to grow this business too. And so I, I think all of that just created this environment where we were a team, we're working hard together, and we're gonna build this together. So maybe talk about the next step. Yeah. So then after that second hire, after or after your your third hire in sales, I guess. Yeah. Talk about the next few hires you made there. Like, what was your mindset now that you had two really successful people that have already figured it out? You had figured it out. Or how 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 did you press on that gas a little bit? Yeah. Um, well, I, I think the first thing was just like, do I have a predictable process that I feel confident in? Right. And I have a, I run the same system. I mean, this is my this is our third business that we've all done together. And we pretty much run the exact same system over and over and over. And it's a, it's a repeatable sales system that is documented, that is kind of spread through kind of conversations and, and amongst, amongst salespeople. And so I think that has to be the foundation is like, is it a winning system that works? Um, and when there's confidence in that, then you can add other people. I, the, the bulk of, of what, what I have done is try to create a promotion-based culture. I look for people who are trying to get their career in sales, whether it's a transitional move for them or whether it's a right out of college type thing, right? And they're hungry to learn and they've got, um, you know, some of those attributes I talked about, like coachability, great listener, really hungry, smart. Um, and if I have those traits and a willingness just to start from the ground up, which usually means starting as an SDR, uh, the, your path is unlimited, right? You, you start there, you pave your way, you prove that you're ready for that next um, AE position. Once you get that AE position through consistent quota hitting, you prove that you're ready to be a senior AE. And I'm just really focused on trying to find people in some ways. I mean, it's like baseball, right? You've got a farm system. You're trying to have a healthy farm system so that when those next hires, when you're ready for scale, you're not outposting the job and trying to solicit these people. You've got people that you have been training from the beginning to be ready for, for this moment for their career to unlock their career too. So we also mentioned that you did this now what three times. So yeah. last year, you changed from Blue Bridge to Amplify. Maybe explain a little bit of what that transition was as you brought the team over to Amplify, how you guys kind of restarted that engine and, and got it going again. What was that experience? So for anybody that's going through a brand change right now or think about going through a brand change right now um, or people that are looking to, to maybe pivot on the, what the company does, there's a lot of different ways you would maybe change your direction. Right. And you guys actually changed who you were selling to, the types yeah. of companies you're selling to. There's a big change. So maybe talk about the types of changes that you had and then how you got the team to roll again. Sure. Yeah, I mean, we really did. In some ways, we started from scratch, but with a with a full company, <laughs> like with our whole company. So, um, you know, the, the, the quick version is that we started this, we started this Blue Bridge, a mobile app company, and really quickly we grew it to become the largest tourism app platform in the country, and we grew it to become the, the um, 
and uh, the second largest church app platform for like mega churches. And our team also grew, you know, from, from just a couple people to about 60 folks. And as we started to grow leadership, we started realizing we were having problems that everybody else has when you start to scale your culture that fast is that we couldn't see inside the hearts and minds of our people. And as technologists, we set about trying to solve that problem. Um, and we realized pretty quickly, like we were onto something, um, coming up with a scientific way to measure how engaged a person is. And then the valuable insights we got and how that started influencing our culture. We just kind of had this like, we're onto something type of moment. So yeah, we made this pretty dramatic pivot. So um, I actually did not know this story that that's yeah. how Amplify was started. So I'm, now I'm just more curious. So I'm a firm believer that really good businesses start out of necessity for a different business and then right. it usually scales. So you guys got the aha moment. Hey, I think we got something here. I really yeah. think we can go sell it. So when was the decision made to, hey, let's go all in, let's go get a brand and a name and let's go pivot some people to this new product. <laughs> when, when was that from an executive level? What was that process like? Yeah, and, and obviously it's it's probably there's a there's a lot of layers to it, you know, that take place behind the scenes to get to get to where we are. So um, it happened pretty organically, right? Originally it was a need to repurpose our app tool back toward our people. And it just kept evolving from there, right? And then we kind of um, and, and, and part of it was because we were in these two verticals and we wanted to add a third, ver we, we had strategically decided we wanted to add a third vertical. So we start testing all these other markets. And yet, meanwhile, our culture committee kind of came to us with this original idea, um, of using our own product back toward ourselves. So then we started selling that basic concept to other people. And then we wanted to prove that it was valuable both to ourselves and others. And so we built this metric of how to measure engagement. And, and kind of just stumbled on our aha moment, which is like, wow, this metric that measures engagement like on a quarterly basis, right, is, um, is just tremendously valuable. And so uh, since my team was kind of, in some ways, and this, was, this is a part I'll look back with with a lot of fondness, but also like, wow, it was a lot of work. I had some people selling basically the tourism product, the church product, and then I uh, went out with one other person and we started opening up this new market. Um, and was you know was fortunate to kind of have that one side being run by um, by one of our like by our sales manager, and I just went out myself uh, with one other person, and we started just landing new customers, and then realized that growth was it was growing you know three times faster than any product we've ever had. So where it's moving right, and uh, you you have to make a decision pretty much as soon as you go, let's let's get all of our effort there because you it's hard to do three things really well, right? So let's right. just focus. So what we end up doing was we sold off our other two businesses, took all that cash, put it into what we're doing, into Amplify. And then we took our whole company and flipped everybody over to that brand as well, which um, was fun. I mean, you know, it's, it's been a lot of work, but it's also a really cool thing that has been a, it's been a lot of fun. Um, I've never experienced anything like this where we're truly a startup, uh, but we've got a full team. And so we can really accomplish a lot of stuff. It's really neat. That is pretty interesting. So you, you basically sound like you piloted it a little bit. So you knew you had some people that were going to be successful. You pilot it. You were a big part of that. Went into this, the Amplify side of business. And then all of a sudden, once you guys knew that there was something there, you just put the cavalry towards it. Yep. So talk about that initial day. How did you ramp your team from, all right, we sell this software or we sell this app. Yeah. To we're going to sell a completely different app. Yeah. And you guys now have quotas, everything up against it. We're going to go all in on marketing. Like how did you just switch the entire company? But specifically, how did you switch the sales team to immediately change their talk track, immediately change who they were selling to, immediately change everything overnight? Yeah. Uh, so that basically to, to achieve, and it really was like overnight, by the way, I mean, that's a great summary of it. But to get there, it was a lot of work in advance, right? It was the, it was what I said earlier, it was me paving the way by learning how to sell it myself and then deconstructing that, right? And so, so what that means is that you've got to come up with a predictable cold call that works. You've got to come up with a predictable discovery template that is repeatable and followable. You've got to have a, a script for your demo and, and, so that the, the, and then your decision process and some success to prove to them that it works. So that was kind of the, the template that I put together and those are kind of the big buckets of, of my sale, you know, of the sales process we run here. Just making sure you have all that in place so that the very first day, right, you can both educate them on the process, but also hand them like the scripting that is needed. And, and of course, first couple of weeks, we do a ton of role playing back and forth uh, with each other. We try to meet and collaborate a lot when you're facing objections because there's 
uh, although I think I you know put together something that worked pretty well when when it's actually in their hands you see it in all of its flaws you realize the areas where it wasn't working as well but it's that's that's what happens when you get more people's eyes on it but so that, that's an interesting process so you you go into you you put together this script you put together this process you get in the hands of the teams you start to see that there's some gaps and holes you're getting feedback from your team talk about some of those adjustments so as you start to scale you're starting from scratch how do you start making some of those adjustments on the fly yeah you know i mean i am like i'm in the middle of that part right now right so we we have been now with this new with the with the full vision of the new product um, my full team now is is basically in quarter one of that, right? So they're in their first quarter. I've been now selling it for about six, uh, two quarters prior, um, and so it's changing. It is it is changing every day. Um, we we try to make the big changes um, on, in our Monday morning meeting, but most of the things are more like, hey, the discovery questions are good, but the usability is not very good. How can I like try? How can we take what we know we need to ask and create a more usable way to digest it during the during the discovery process? Um, or, but the other thing that happens is these are good, talented salespeople, right? So just last week, for example, I was listening to one of my reps um, on a call, and I'm taking notes for myself, right? Because we really encourage innovation and like trying new things too. And when they uncover something that when one person uncovers it, we want to get that back to other people too. Um, and, and before it was just me creating a rudimentary structure, but now we're trying to get it to masterclass. Like what are the things you can do to iterate, grow and, and learn from one another? So to summarize kind of where you were with your last company and now where you're at with your new company is a lot of it started with just foundational excellence. Getting really good at the basics and, and getting that right and then adjusting on the fly as you start to master some of the other things that you're working through. Yeah. I mean, yeah, and I, I really think in sales, right, more than anything else, like it, sales technique matters so much. I, I've shadowed a couple other um, companies, tech companies, friendlies here in, in, in Indianapolis where I'll go to them and we'll shadow calls. And, and you know what you realize is that like if you're running an hour sales meeting, You've got this kind of five to five to uh, like the first fifteen to twenty, whatever that discovery moment is, whether it's the five minutes or thirty minutes, and then you've got this decision portion of the call, and there's all sorts of sales magic that's taking place. And in the middle, you can just pop around company to company, and it just sounds like Spanish. It sounds, it sounds like just a, it sounds like a foreign language, right? Because I don't know it. But it's amazing where even when you don't know that a very technical thing, when you know the front and the back end how sales foundations are still the key to like whether or not you make progress from a person moving forward or not. Did I uncover real pain? Did I actually understand their situation? When I demonstrated, did I tie it back to that pain? And when I get to the end, it's do I know not just what the next step is, but do I know every step? And did I actually motivate that person to go from this is okay, this is an agreeable meeting to like, I am willing to sign and put my reputation on the line and give you money and trust that this is a great thing that's gonna change my world. Um, and that, that what's, those things, they're timeless things. You know, they're product agnostic, they can move, they move, uh, they always go with you no matter what you, what you sell. So you, you mentioned earlier that you're a learner, you're constantly trying to figure things out. So as you scaled or started from scratch these sales teams, what are some of the, like, what's the biggest aha moment that you think you've caught where you're like, gosh, I wish I would have done this the first time we built the team? <laughs> well, let's see. Um, well, I, I mean, if you just like right now for me, and I know there's probably people who are way further on this journey than I am, so take this with a grain of salt, right? I think um, early I relied too much on what I call like the oral tradition, basically like I talk and they learn and then they're supposed to absorb it all and, and uh, um, but as you start to scale, like the proximity to the center is just, it's just harder to have. Like you just don't get as much face time. You don't get as much one-on-one. -on -one. And so um, coming up with ways to create resources that allow people to scale themselves and get, put them in the opportunity and, and trying to systematize some things that used to be very organic. That's the world I'm in right now. It's turning what used to be a really organic process. Like it's easy to share and collaborate because we're around each other all the time to um, if you get less time, how are you intentional about how, how you collaborate? How do you use technology to help you collaborate? Things like that. It's interesting. So when is the first time you felt that? So this, as you got to a certain level where you're like, I just don't feel like I have my hands 
on everything like I used to, or I just don't feel like I can affect things the same way with a lot of fluidity or I have to have a system in place. What is the first time you felt that? How many employees was it? Is there a yeah. moment that specifically happened? You're like, Ooh, man, I missed it. Or wow. I can't believe I haven't been able to see that yet. Yeah. Looking back, I mean, if I could do it all over again, I really think it was probably that batch of hires after those two, <laughs> the first two, to be honest, I think, um, we, you can still muscle your way for a while, but, um, but early with new products too, for me and, and maybe other people can, can do it differently. I, I think around five or six people, um, where, where the person just can't sit beside you all day. Like, I mean, I write, as you, as I mentioned earlier, I'm like a practitioner. So a lot of the early onboarding was just sitting in the room beside me, me selling the product. And then uh, for five meetings, which is my normal, you know, onboarding where I'll run five meetings with them beside me, then they'll run five meetings with me shadowing. And, um, you kind of run into a math issue when you run hour meetings of how many people you can do that for, <laughs> you know, to where you, you need to come up with different ways to scale. So what was the next step? So, all right. I love it. this is, this yeah. is actually getting really tactical for people <laughs> that are trying to do it from scratch. So yeah, yeah, yeah. You had five meetings for you and then five meetings for them and you listened to your riding shotgun. What happened after you hit that fifth or sixth person where you no longer could do that? How do you then scale the team after that? Yeah. Um, well, we tr I try to utilize the other people on the team, you know, so it's, uh, it looks, it looks more like there are people around that are having success and doing this right that I trust implicitly. Right. And so what I want is I want it, I want their success to, to, um, help other people. And I mean, right. You do. I have realized obviously is, that is almost more contagious than, than I'm their boss, right? So there, it's a little different. There's more, there's more, um, there's just more layers there. But if it's a peer who you're shadowing and learning from, and then who's willing to listen and learn too. So usually it looks like shadowing peers, um, a much more scaled down version of me helping uh, occasionally. And then, but then me being very, very intentional about call feedback, you know, especially early. Um, because early before your kind of your uh, wires or your routes get too deep where you keep doing the same bad pattern, you know, the bad habits over and over, I want to make sure that I'm listening to enough calls that I can course correct people and get them on that right path first. And if you, if you get those, those paths right, you can create a predictable thing where they're constantly, you know, consistently bringing in revenue for you. Awesome. So I, I think we covered a ton. I think people are gonna have lots of notes to take off this one. Adam, if they want to reach out to you and, and, and learn more, how do they get in touch with you? Um, and how do they, how do they help? How do they help themselves? Yep. First, I mean, if you, uh, you can email me at Adam at Amplify.com. If when I told you about the product, you were like, that's awesome. Just drop your credit card number in that uh, email. I will gladly swipe it for you. We'd love to have you on board. Uh, and, and if you're in a, if you're a, a person that's looking to get into sales, um, or, or you want to talk about a sales career, I'd also, I'd also love to have that conversation. I mean, as you know, Phil, I'm just like everyone else. I'm constantly in the process of building my bench. I always try to foster relationships and I just love investing in salespeople's lives and helping them further their careers. So, um, yeah, I would love to help and, and answer questions, especially if you're building a team from scratch right now yourself. Um, and you're trying to figure out how to do it. Um, I'd love to love to have the conversation. So thanks for having me, Phil. I really enjoyed it. Uh, it's, it's always fun to talk. So we catch up. We, we have one more. We have exclusive YouTube content. Oh, awesome. We're going to go through rapid fire questions. We need oh, to do it. Your, your honest answer. So we're going to go through uh, three rapid fire questions. So anybody that's listening on our podcast on any of the uh, audio versions of this, jump over to YouTube. Make sure you subscribe. But we're going to jump into three rapid fire questions, and then we're going to wrap up. So Adam, what's the best book you've read for sales professionals? Oh, best book for sales professionals. Um, I, I would, I think, I mean, just the classic for me, the classic is you can't teach a kid to ride a bike at a seminar. It covers so many of the basics. Um, I love taking the timeless principles in that book and tying it to new school sales. So that'd probably be mine. Awesome. Uh, second question. Who is a sales professional that you've learned something from and what was the, what was the takeaway? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, man. There are so, I've been so fortunate to have some great relationships that have helped me, helped me develop in my, my own. Um, I think, uh, more, I, I've learned more from Brian Kavicki, who's my sales coach than anybody, um, ever in the world. And I think my biggest aha moment when I started working with him, uh, was tied to how I talk about price and fixing my own buy cycle. 
you know, trying to come up. I used to just be scared of money. Anytime money got bigger than $5,000, I, I, I got really scared. And, uh, and I think him, uh, helping change the way that I purchase things myself, just actually, and I've been working with him for eight years, but, uh, a quick story is I, um, last week, right. This is like the culmination of eight years in, in sales. I walked into a car dealership and I said, Hey, I'm buying a car right now. Uh, so let's, uh, let's figure this out. One dealer, one dealership, one salesperson made the decision on the spot and walk and paid in cash. And it was just like the coolest moment. You know, you're like, this is why you do sales. Like, so you can walk into places like this and you feel super confident. And of course the other rep is just sweating and it was just, it was awesome. But, uh, it, it was a, it was a fundamental different way when I realized how much money is impacted. Like you bring your own baggage into sales and learning how to detach that myself. Very cool. What is the one thing that irritates you about sales today that you wish would stop? Um, boy, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, less, less gotcha moments. Uh, maybe like when you're trying to trick people, uh, I would, I would much prefer that people are just honest, transparent, candid, thoughtful, that they challenge people when they need to challenge them. And it's not about, um, it, it's not about trying to trap people into a corner. It's about joining the prospect, making them your teammate and helping see if you can change their world you can make their world better. And if you can, awesome. And if you can't just move on <laughs> and you'll, you'll, you'll enjoy the profession a lot more and you'll be a lot prouder of the work that you do. Awesome. Adam, it has been an absolute pleasure to interview you. I actually learned a ton about <laughs> things that you and I have never explored in, in the conversation awesome. before. So uh, absolutely great. For anybody that's a sales professional, please look Adam up. Uh, his email address is adam at amplify.com. Adam, it's a pleasure. Real Sales Talk family. Until next time, see you in the next episode. Thanks, Phil.